Okay, so <clears throat> I think we're gonna get started. Thank you for those who are here. Um, we This is the first panel of Theories in Action, which is a weekend long um, event, uh, which you know tries to cultivate a space for seniors as well, uh, seniors at Brown as well as the community of Brown at, uh, writ large to come together and reflect on what it means to be a Brown student and you know to showcase how people spend their time um, and the type of scholarly pursuits that they uh, have here at Brown. So uh, my name is Hector Peralta. I am one of the coordinators of uh, TIA here uh, through the CRC. Um, and it is my honor to present this round table titled From Campus to Nation, Cities, and Migration. Uh, and I, I will allow our panel um, members to introduce themselves. Um, but please, you know, join me in walking welcoming them to uh, the first panel. Um, hi, my name is Ria Vaitya, and my um, project that I'll be talking about today is titled No Country for Women. Hi, my name is Anna Maria Manessis, and I'll be talking about um, my project, Housing Rights and Resistance, a comparative study in Kathmandu, Nepal, and Santiago, Chile. Hi everyone, my name is Anshul Saraf and I will be talking about a project I did my junior year called Geographies of Safety, Mapping Safe Spaces for Students of Color at Brown. Hi everybody, my name is Aida Palma uh, and today I'm gonna be talking about my senior thesis, Chinese Paisanos in Guadalajara, Mexico, Rethinking South-South Migration. All right, does anyone know how to make this projector show what's on the screen? All right, we just explained to you our projects. There's a visual. <laughs> so the first thing we'll be talking about is uh, our own personal positionalities that went into working through these projects. And we're gonna be talking from a micro to macro scale. So uh, I'll be going first as I was thinking through uh, how my positionality affected my project on this campus. So I was looking at uh, examining whether students of color at Brown felt safe or unsafe in certain physical spaces on campus. And though I am a part of the community of students of color, that does not necessarily mean that I hold all of the identities that those students also hold at like multiple intersections. And so I really had to think critically about whether or not the ways in which I was asking questions, the ways in which um, I was developing this project would allow, would allow for people to share to the amount in which they wanted to share. Uh, so I decided to do an anonymous Google form that folks had to use uh, their brown.edu email to access. And in that they could share what spaces made them feel safe or unsafe and for what reasons without having to disclose extra information. So it was really just allowing people to interpret in their own way what safety meant and what comfort meant and what inclusion meant uh, on a very spatial level and a physical level of embodiment in these spaces. And rather than trying to push people to disclose all of their identities, really just making it uh, an experience of allowing students of color who may not have a platform to talk about the physical spatial violences that sort of exist in the university that we don't necessarily think about on the day to day allow them to share that in an anonymous way to the extent that they wanted to share it. And that's sort of how I worked through my positionality in my project was uh, giving some distance while also recognizing the humanity of the people and the, the vulnerability that they were exposing themselves to in the sharing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, with my project, what I was doing was I was, um, I co-founded a nonprofit with a fellow student from Brown uh, her name is Shrina, and um, we just started, it was like a very small project. We thought we were just gonna do it for the summer and then come back to Brown. Um, we were giving workshops um, in schools and colleges around India on, um, on rape culture and 
uh, gender roles and gender in public space and, and things like that. And <coughs> um, I came in as, like I grew up in Bangalore, India. I spent all of my life there and I um, came to the US for college. So what it seemed like I was doing was that I was coming back with all of these like Western ideas of how women should be treated and it seemed like to a lot of people like I was being brainwashed by like and, and being like westernized. So when I came back to deliver workshops, I was seen as an outsider, even though I had spent my whole life in the place and I was very aware of the cultural norms and there were no language barriers or anything like that. <coughs> so it was, um, yeah, just an, it was weird to navigate how to not perpetuate a colonial mindset of, oh, Western ideas and uh, Western ideas are better and progress should be conflated with westernization um, while still trying to make the lives of Indian women better. Um, so my project, um, I had a pretty privileged positionality to mine. Um, I was studying abroad as a United States citizen um, and I was in the countries for uh, Nepal and Chile for a month each. Um, and in Chile I was only able to conduct uh, the language, the, interview in Spanish and then in Nepal I had to use an interpreter so my data for Chile was substantially um, more detailed than the one for uh, Nepal. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really it. <laughs> um, for my project I was returning to my birth home, so Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, nevertheless, I think I definitely had to think a lot about positionality uh, while conducting my ethnographic research because I was the outsider coming into a community of Chinese immigrants. Um, and when I started the project, there right now there's not a lot of things that are published about them. I had a couple of news articles to guide myself and like the design of the project before showing up to the city. Um, but I had to I, I had to be very careful about my positionality as a Mexi as a Mexican national, understanding that maybe some of these immigrants would be undocumented and would be at vulnerable positions talking to someone that maybe they could consider as part of the Mexican national body and that be, could seem threatening in the sense that like maybe it was someone from the government that was coming around to to try to gather information from them. So I think in my research that was really important and we try to stay away from topics that, um, in the questions that might bring out the vulnerab vulnerabilities in, in the migrant experience. Um, and for that reason, it's a project that's much more centered on, on the mechanisms through which they find upward mobility in Guadalajara. So another important component of our work, uh, sort of thinking and thinking through positionality as being a big part of this was scholar activism. And this is this idea that scholarship can be intrinsically aligned with activist causes. And all of us have a particular commitment to scholar activism in the work that we did in our projects. So I know for me, I this project was born out of uh, junior year. I was in a class called Land Use and Capitalism, and we had an assignment that was given to us where we had to use participatory mapping. And there was a way in which I could have maybe used that assignment to quickly get an assignment done and then sort of move on and continue in my class. Uh, but the goals of participatory mapping have always been to create, to destabilize power. Uh, maps are created from the gaze of the imperial, like the imperialist, the colonizer, uh, maps are created from people who are w wanting to silence and wanting to minimize experience. The participatory mapping directly destabilizes that kind of control and power that maps have because it allows people, the groundswell, the grassroots, to actually be the ones creating the visualization of space. And I couldn't let an opportunity like that uh, pass by. So in trying to, invoke this idea of scholar activism within the work that I did, I went to the communities I was a part of and asked some people what they saw as a useful way of me doing this project. And something that sort of came up out of conversations around uh, sexual violence that had been committed around Brown, around conversations of racial violence that had been committed around Brown, um, all these other sort of silent stories, but also moments of community and moments of building and moments of people finding uh, safety and 
kinship with, with others in physical spaces at this university were also not really being highlighted. And so I decided to create this mapping project to, to give this platform to allow for some of these stories to come to the forefront in a really visual way and flip the script in terms of what happens when you look at a map of Brown and don't see any of these stories within. Uh, so you're just seeing the buildings. You're not seeing the history of University Hall, who it was built by, who it was built for. You're not seeing the history of the Center for Students of Color, how it was created, what its history is. And so I think that was what the underlying activism within the scholarship of this project was for me. Um, <clears throat> the co-founder, my co-founder and I both met at the Third World Transition Program our freshman year. And uh, we were both basically just mind blown because I had never heard of how to like, analyze cultural artifacts and stuff like that and see how they contribute to misogyny and racism and stuff. So yeah, we were both mind blown. And th that, that was the first day we became like friends and we just spent all night chatting going like, oh my god, so I guess this is sexist. Oh my god, I guess this is sexist too. And suddenly we just had the language to actually identify what um, to like, articulate the ways in which we were restricted, um, especially within our like lives in India. So we, like a, a couple of months later, um, this really horrific incident happened in India where um, a medical student was raped and that led to protests all over the country. And um, Srina and I sat down and we were like, hey, you know, like we learned all this stuff and like we're continuing to learn so much while we're at Brown, should we just like take these concepts and try and also deliver them to students in India just so that people can like have some sort of awareness because it was such, it was such a like life altering moment for us, like our time getting exposed to this stuff at TWTP that we just felt like we really needed to share um, the language and the concepts with other students. So that's like how we, like did our scholar activism thing. We just took, I mean, we still didn't know that much because <laughs> we were like sophomores, but whatever we did, we tried to package it in a way that we could um, give it to students who were in high school and that's, yeah, how we did it. Um, so I was interested in doing my project because um, as part of our study abroad program, we spent the first two weeks in New York and um, we spent time with a community organization called CASA um, and they're basically a tenants' rights organization, um, and they do a lot of work in terms of rent stabilization, um, providing legal aid, um, and basically I was really uh, inspired by their work, and I wanted to see if there were similar trends in um, urban displacement, gentrification, in the countries that we were gonna be going to. Um, and so um, I just, basically I had a lot of questions about um, how communities um, access the city, um, and uh, the various resources it has. Um, um, but then I was, I didn't just wanna focus on like, oh, gentrification is so terrible, gentrification is so sad. Um, I wanted to see um, how different communities uh, built collective power through just either having community or an organization. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore that throughout my study abroad experience. Um, the scholar activism component of my thesis uh, very much is in the fact that this migration flow that I attempted to study um, is relatively recent, so it starts in the year 2000, and Guadalajara is a city in Mexico which, first of all, is um, one of the major metro, like metropolitan areas in the country. Um, but unlike Mexico City, unlike some of the northern border regions, it doesn't have a history of Chinese immigration. Um, so for the people who are Mexican locals, who are Guadalajara locals, this flow that has occurred over the past, since 2000, over the past 16 years, is very much unprecedented, is very much unexpected, and we're definitely seeing a cultural clash to an extent um, where people because they are not completely integrated into the social space because their migration is so new, still haven't learned how to interact with Mexican locals, Guadalajara and people don't really know how to interact with the Chinese immigrants outside of these commercial spaces um, that we see through the, through, the cre through the establishment of a restaurant niche within the Chinese um, immigrant community. So what I hoped my project would also do um, 
um, once it gets published in a, in a smaller version in, in Guadalajara, is help close this cultural gap, help close some of the curiosity and some of the mysticism that is associated with Chinese culture in Guadalajara, and that affects the way in which um, the local population sees, perceives, and interacts um, with the immigrants that are increasingly entering the, the social space. All right, so now to sort of think through what we found out from our respective projects. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so this is a screenshot of the map that I created through the course of my project. Uh, I'll take you all through some of the examples of testimonies that came through and then uh, sort of reflect on what was said. So uh, some of the things that were talked about, for example, were students who put in testimonies about feeling unsafe in uh, Riston, which is like a fraternity space. Um, and they gave various examples of why that happened. And so, for example, what something that had happened, I think, my junior year was that there were allegations of um, date rape drugs being used at one of the parties at FISI. And so a student had recorded something regarding that. Also, there had been uh, a lot of allegations regarding uh, there being instances of assault at Sigma. Um, other fraternities were also sort of being examined in terms of uh, being unsafe spaces for people who may hold multiple marginalized identities. And that was something I saw reflected in the map. And then it was also important to look at the, the ways in which multiple students going into spaces felt both, there were students who felt safe and who felt unsafe uh, within the same sort of physical space. And I think that's something that's important to consider because it is uh, this idea of individual interaction with spatiality. So students who are coming in who hold a whole host of identities, there's no reason that one particular building will be immutably safe and inclusive and community building for one student. Uh, that takes a collaborative effort. So an example I'm using to show, illustrate that here is these competing notions of the Brown Center for Students of Color being safe, a safe place for a student of color to be and interact with. Um, so one student felt that it was inclusive, that they could take a nap there, that they saw people who were committed to providing support, but another student felt that they didn't know a lot of people in this community and that they felt uncomfortable and that they were looked at differently when they entered this space because they didn't know a lot of folks. So sort of thinking through those two example sizes I showed you all, there was both an opportunity for students to really be open about particular violence, violences that they'd experienced or heard being experienced without fear of retaliation or being uh, told that they were not valid in experiencing these things because everything that was submitted to me for the most part, uh, there are a couple of things which I'll get to later in terms of community pushback. Almost everything that was submitted to me, I put on the map. And so even though there were things that were conflicting with one another, it still created a really expansive notion of what felt inclusive and what felt safe to students and what didn't. And while I personally think that my junior year self could have stood to do this project in better ways, uh, which I'll certainly talk about later, there was, I think there were around 55 testimonies that I received, uh, which of course is nowhere near a complete survey of all of the students <coughs> of color at this university, but is like a huge chunk of people, which is really exciting. Um, and it did allow a platform for those voices at least to have their, uh, have themselves be heard. Um, I was also able to sort of publish an analysis of the map itself in Blue Stockings that semester and have people sort of see traction, have traction for the map that way and have people be allowed to look at, uh, there is like an interactive space within the article where people could go and read the different things that were written on the map. Uh, and there's such a variety of things. There are very personal spaces, personal spaces that felt good to people. Uh, for example, someone had written about the Burt Greenhouse being a really peaceful space for them. Uh, someone had written about their dorm room, but also places that were heavily trafficked like the Blue Room or sales. And so being able to see those multiple levels of both intimacy, uh, self, like created ideas of self-safety, uh, as well as community ideas of safety were really, really fascinating, exciting, and uh, empowering to allow people to really have this space to 
the space to be able to talk about these things. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, um, no Country for Women would deliver workshops in schools and colleges around India. And depending on what the administrators or the students wanted, we had different modules. So if we would go to like, if we were talking to like pre-law students or something like that, we would talk about um, gender and the law and how laws are inherently, like some laws are inherently misogynistic in India. Um, and one of our modules was um, gender in public space. So if you, <coughs> If anyone over here has ever been to India, or if you ever go to India, just keep an eye out when you enter an urban space because you'll notice that it is just dominated by men. There are only men on the streets. And if there are women, they, ha they have to have a purpose. They can't just be loitering there for no reason. So women have to be uh, either like selling something or they have to be, um, I don't know, clearly like traversing the street, not just staying in one place and sitting down. So. Um, when we delivered our one of the one of like the gender and public space module at a conference once, um, we opened it up by asking the women in the room to stand up if they had ever felt out of place uh, in the city, and every single woman stood up and said, "Yeah, I don't know if I'm just ever like standing in one place for more than five seconds without anything to do, then I just suddenly get really uncomfortable because." There's only men around me. There's like, I can't even look to another woman for, for help to stand next to her or something like that. And even if no one is ever doing anything, even if no one is heckling you or like screaming at you, it just, you just feel out of place. You feel like you don't belong in public spaces as a woman. Um, so um, there was this campaign that was started by um, another group, it wasn't our group, and the campaign just spread all over India and it was called Why Loiter? And that's the, the little um, newspaper clip on the right side of the screen. And what it was, was women just posting photos of themselves loitering around the streets at midnight, at 3 a.m., at 5 a.m., which is obviously like unsafe, but it was a way to push back against the fact that women are just seen as unwelcome in public spaces. So women were posting photos, um, and sharing essays and stuff like that. And it was a really cool movement. It started just about two years ago. And since then, I've been seeing, on Indian streets, I've been seeing um, like graffiti saying, women stand here and loiter and, and stuff like that. It's been exciting. Um, if you could go next. Uh, and one of the things that Srina and I used to talk a lot, a lot about during um, our gender and public space module was women's safety. So. In India, after um, the incident that I, that I earlier spoke about that occurred in December 2012, um, a city called Gurgaon, which is <clears throat> part of the national capital region of India, um, uh, established a curfew for women, stating that women couldn't work after 8 p.m. And it's still not formally in place, but my sister lives in Gurgaon and she is only allowed to work until 6 p.m. and then a security guard escorts her outside of her workplace. And people kind of accepted it because there's this weird notion that, oh yeah, you know, it's like we should drop our women home and keep them safe rather than we should, why, why not just uh, like force men, all men to be indoors after 8 p.m.? Why is that not the idea that you come up with? Um, also, uh, since then, um, and these existed before as well. There's been a big move to have women-only um, areas in cities or like in transport. So there's women's compartments in uh, trains and buses and metros. And there's also um, a lot of CCTV cameras being installed in urban spaces. So just like surveillance to see like, oh, can like maybe this will help us like catch potential like assailants and rapists, but I mean, when you really think about it, is segregation the way to, to solve this issue in India? Is, shouldn't we be normalizing the presence of the woman in public spaces, but also a lot of women want to, want like these women-only spaces because that's the only way they feel safe, even though in the long run it might not help the cause. Um, and so we had a lot of debates regarding that during our workshops. and. I mean, I personally don't agree with this, but most of the students that we were speaking to said that like, 
these things that are listed out make them feel safer. Um, and I'm wondering if and when there will be an attitude change towards like, kind of renouncing all of these safety measures and calling for the normalization of the woman in public spaces. Um, so this is just a um, reminder again that um, I did my research in Kathmandu, Nepal, and um, that's just a map of Kathmandu. And then here's a map of Santiago, Chile. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so I wanted to begin by defining the, um, the communities that I spoke with as they define themselves, um, because I really wanted to um, like center their narratives in my work and not just use um, another definition, which I will bring up um, later. Um, and also how they um, defined um, urban displacement. So in Kathmandu, the population I spoke to, um, as described by one of my interviewees, Sabine Niglaku, um, Arazukambasi, and there are squatter communities who um, are mobilizing to meet basic needs such as um, water and electricity and for claiming land ownerships and citizenship. And the second population I spoke with in um, in Chile are the pobladores, and um, this is actually from a book that they published, um, and it says, well, it's, I translated it, but it says, um, groups excluded from the city without basic services, far from work, drowned by material poverty and stigmatized by society. Um, so that's just how they define themselves. And so I've been using this term, urban displacement, and um, I kind of wanted to also give context as to how they define themselves. Um, so in Nepal, uh, they describe the process of urban displacement as uh, people come to Kathmandu because of economic status, agriculture, no longer enough to support someone, untouchability in the caste system, natural calamities, uh, facility and employment opportunities, facilities and employment opportunities. Okay. Um, and then Doris Gonzalez from Ucamao, the organization I spoke with in Chile, uh, she said that um, the government builds houses in isolation. We need to build community. Poor are expelled from the city. They say there isn't enough room. In communities, there is insufficient education or health buildings. Um, they get the poor out of the city pushed to the borders of the city. Um, so these are just quotes from the interviews I took of um, the one, one of the representatives from the communities I spoke with. Um, oh, and so this is um, the framework that I was using in my paper. Um, it's from an academic piece from, from Slater. Um, it's a pretty long definition, but <laughs> I guess I can read it out loud. Um, okay, so gentrification commonly occurs in urban areas where prior disinvestment in the urban infrastructure creates opportunities for profitable redevelopment, where the needs and concerns of business and policy elites are met at the expense of urban residents affected by work instability, unemployment, and stigmatization. It also occurs in the societies where a loss of manufacturing employment and an increase in service employment has led to expansion in the amount of middle class professionals with disposition towards central city living and an associated rejection of suburbia. So I guess like that's like the more, um, that was the, the academic definition, but I did want to present the definitions that the communities gave of the process they were going through, um, just to like center those narratives. Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, Cool. So now that I've defined my terms, um, I guess I wanted to focus in on a specific part of urban displacement, which is called um, direct last resident displacement. And it's kind of a form of pushing people from their neighborhoods, um, which occurs through economic or physical means. Um, so economic, um, as I mentioned in New York, there was a lot of work in rent stabilization. Um, and so when communities are pushed from their homes, it's through rent increases. Um, or physical means. Um, many of the activists I spoke to, um, their houses um, were often just like, they were like t torn down um, because they said that they didn't have the, the land rights in Nepal um, to have those houses. So um, it wasn't technically illegal to um, take down their houses. Um, so in Kathmandu, not like Nepal. Um, and another way that um, we can conceptualize it in terms of physical um, Displacement is um, when landlords cut off the heat in a building, and so um, it's kind of like forcing uh, people to leave their homes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I also, in my title, I said I was going to speak about housing rights. Um, so I also want to uh, define that a little bit more, too. Um, 
So I specifically wrote about the right to safe and affordable housing. Um, so the right to have a home with um, basic services um, and to be located in a place where you have access to uh, quality education, job opportunities, health care, et cetera. Um, and maintain is um, knowing that you're going to be able to keep living in the neighborhood you've been living in uh, without being pushed out through the economic or physical means as I defined earlier. Um, and safe, um, this was more, um, more of a theme in, in Santiago um, where the houses that, um, that the government did build for the communities, they um, often weren't really high quality. Um, when it rained, like the, the roofs would just kind of like cave in. Um, and so like that wouldn't really qualify as safe housing. So also mean having that right be clear. Um, and so lastly, so um, I didn't really talk about this um, so much in this presentation, but I think it's important in how um, I analyze the process that's happening. Um, so it's about state redistribution. And um, so I'm going to read out a definition from another theoretical text. Um, so it says, state distribution is the state, once transformed into a new neoliberal set of institutions, becomes a prime agent for redistributive policies, reversing the flow from the upper to the lower classes that had occurred during the era of social democratic hegemony. Um, so that's like a lot of words, but like <laughs> um, basically it's trying to get at the point that um, that uh, gentrification, urban displacement, urban displacement as it's occurring, it's um, a really intentional way of like how um, the neoliberal um, economy functions and how um, uh, people's homes and um, their neighborhoods are kind of used in this um, in these policies to kind of like um, to bring like the wealth from from the the lower classes to the upper classes, so just the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. Um, and so I, I analyze urban displacement and gentrification as an effect of this larger process of state redistribution. Um, so I'm just going to go back to the maps. Um, OK. So, oh, well, OK. OK. So, to get more into detail of how um, urban displacement function in Nepal, uh, now that I've defined some terms, it's um, it usually occurs a lack of, a result of lack of land rights. So uh, many of the campaigns that the activists I spoke to were related to being able to get land citizenship and land ownership rights, um, because if they had that rights, then it would be illegal to um, like tear down their homes that um, they had built for themselves, um, and. Um, and it says that uh, people leave um, areas far from Kathmandu um, to go to Kathmandu because in Kathmandu there's more, um, they said that there was more uh, education systems, healthcare, job opportunities. Um, and, uh, but like the issue is that in Kathmandu, land, rent and land prices are really expensive. So um, the Sukhumbasi kind of fight for the right to live in the city because um, they kind of fight for it just kind of like by existing, by uh, creating these squatter communities and like building their own homes. Um, because the, they say that, that they have a right to um, try to, and find jobs, try to uh, send their kids to good schools. Um, so like they protest just kind of like by being there, but also through other means. Um, and um, they said that Raju Tamang, uh, one of the representatives I spoke to said that in order to kind of like stop this migration all to Kathmandu where um, there is, where the land prices and rent prices are very high is that um, they should increase education and employment in villages. Migration and displacement will continue because it is facilitated by the government itself. So here he brings up the term of uh, state redistribution again where it's like a very intentional thing uh, because um, he says like the state kind of facilitates this migration um, and this displacement. Um, hmm. And getting, I'm going to move on to Chile. Um, so uh, Doris had a really cool um, definition. Wait, where is it? Hmm. I don't have it. Oh, no. Oh, wait, no. So Doris uh, said the definition I said earlier of what urban displacement looks like. Um, so just that the poor are expelled from the city and um, when houses are built, they're built um, in isolation, so they're really far away from the city. And um, 
So like I just really liked her definition because it was like less lofty and it kind of really described like what um, what I saw when I was there. Um, and she uses the definition I brought up before of direct last resident displacement. She says it in the quote of, they, um, the government get the port of the city pushed to the border of the city. So um, again, putting the blame of, uh, of urban displacement on the government, saying it's a very intentional state process. Um, and so Lodi said that, um, she has this quote that says, the private sector takes advantage of the necessity of the family. They sell land at expensive rates. The private sector charges the state in the family. This is not legal. Um, so sometimes like the government claims land ownership where población is, um, so um, a community of pobladores. And um, when they do this, the communities are pushed out of the homes. And she was saying that this is actually not legal because they hadn't, um, they just kind of like claim land ownership without any real process. Um, and so um, this allows for the communities to like leave their homes and um, often this is done through the use of police force and destruction of the homes. Um, and she says that when the families do attempt to apply for social housing uh, through like the, the legal means, um, there's not really a system for it because um, the representative changes uh, with each term. So then they keep changing the system how to apply for social housing, um, which isn't even that safe as I said before to begin with. Um, and so moving more towards the activism that I studied. Um, oh man, feels rough. Um, so I had mentioned the two organizations that I had spoken with. Um, so Uca Mau in Chile um, is just an organization of Oaladores. Um, they have really successful um, weekly meetings where everyone shows up and um, they kind of discuss in a non-hierarchical format of uh, what they want from the next campaign, like how their current campaign is going, um, what needs they have, and um, they also try to build alliances um, across Latin America, actually. Um, and so I thought, I thought this was really interesting because they kind of like learn from uh, different Latin American organizations, but also within Santiago they speak with environmental, educational, labor rights, and Mapuche rights. With Mapuche is an indigenous group in uh, Chile. Mm. But uh, so also they believe kind of in, within the system work um, because she herself is running to be a representative um, this year, I guess, since I studied abroad last year. Um, because uh, she wants to kind of change this idea that we, they shouldn't trust politicians and that um, kind of like working within the system to um, have like a solidified form of applying for social housing. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to show people a map of the country in case you're not as familiar with it. Jalisco, the state where Guadalajara is located, you'll see signaled in, it, it's pink on this map and I wish I had a pointer so I could, in case you can't differentiate, but it's in the Pacific coast um, and it's like right at the curve of Mexico. So Guadalajara is the capital city of the state. And what is really impressive about this migration and why I started doing this research is that you're seeing, we're seeing a south to south flow. So that's like, um, like in the division of global south and global north, which is a, a, a terminology we use in development studies. Um, so China and Mexico both considered countries in the developing world instead of the developed world. Um, normally we would, we, we would see migration flows happening from what is the global south to the global north, especially when we're talking about such large distances, right? So these immigrants are crossing the Pacific Ocean, um, coming into a country where they know very little about the culture, they virtually almost, no, none of them upon arriving know the language. Um, and then they come into the city, Guadalajara, which like I said is a big, it's one of the big metropolitan areas in the country. Um, so what this research tries to demonstrate is that contrary to how we normally tend to think about migration, right, that working class people, people who are trying to find better economic opportunities for their families will travel to regions of the 
quote unquote global north because that is where opportunities lie. So these are the United States, the developed countries of Europe, Australia, Japan, even in, 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 in the Pacific, right? So we, we tend to think that working class families, people who want to seek better opportunities will go to these kinds of countries. But the diasporic Chinese communities demonstrate that that's not always the case and that we need to rethink the way in which we see the global south, understanding that there are cities and there are pockets of development all across the world um, in this larger way of wave of globalization that is offering opportunities for people to also have development and growth in those regions. Um, but specifically about the migratory dynamics, so how people get there and how they're able to operate in countries that that maybe don't have the same type of migratory mechanisms just because their immigrant populations aren't as large as those countries in the global north. We learned that social networks are fundamental. So fun social networks in any type of migration flow are very important. You go where you have family, you go where you have friends, and those family and friends help you figure out how to navigate the system that you're entering. Um, but especially in these patterns of south to south migration, um, they become they become fundamental because there's not a lot of, of information that is known prior to the migration about Mexico from China in this case. And of course, that's what um, I would interpret would be the case in any other types of flows that follow this pattern. Um, so for the immigrants that are coming into Guadalajara, for most of them, yes, there were economic reasons for them to leave um, Canton, which is where most of them are primarily coming from. And there are economic reasons for them to come into Guadalajara, again, this like pocket of development within Mexico. Um, but so the, 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 their social networks, their family, their friends are the ones that are able to secure the, the migration. It is the mechanism through which they are able um, to arrive in Mexico to know, first of all, that there's a city like Guadalajara that can offer opportunities. And once they're there, know the ways in which they can become documented immigrants, gain access into the Mexican political system, giving them greater access to the economic to the economic system and then allowing their children to go into schools and to occupy different spaces other than the restaurant niche that they originally populate. Um, so this is the way like social networks mechanism through which migrants arrive. Then this allows for the perpetuation of more migration, right? So you have families that become established in order to employ, like in order to um, run their restaurants, they bring in more Chinese people um, to, work as, to work as employees who then also are able to access upward mobility uh, processes. And what we are starting to see, and it's in the, like, in the very basic forms of development because it is a migration flow that is predominantly coming in in the past 16 years, is that people are spreading to new markets and new locations. So that's really important because while Guadalajara might be this city that uh, can attract immigrants because of its own economic development and the own prosperity that people find within the city, we also see that immigrants themselves um, are becoming established and are seeking to enter different markets that take them outside of this restaurant field and that are able and, and they are able to spread into different parts of Mexico. So if we go back to the previous image, um, like I said, arriving to Guadalajara means just crossing the Pacific. Um, but if you travel throughout the rest of Mexico, it's interesting because even outside of these large metropolitan areas, in smaller towns in Jalisco, you will also find isolated cases of Chinese immigrants. So people who are on their own trying to explore new markets and new locations within Mexico. Um, you'll also find them in the peninsula. And these are regions that um, are relatively homogenous in the sense of the like Mexican mestizo population in, in which the urban spaces are in Mexico, you know? And then you have very large indigenous communities outside of the urban spaces. But more and more we're seeing how these Chinese immigrants, this wave that's been coming in for the past 16 years, isn't staying isolated to just the urban spaces which which they occupy initially, but is rather spreading roots into the rest of the country, like we would expect from migration waves in the United States, for example. So you have, even in Providence, you know, the first Latinos to enter this, this society came from New York and they spread into different areas of the country trying to find new opportunities. But that's not what we would see or what we no normally think 
um, about cases of south to south migration that tend to happen intra regionally because it's less expensive to travel from Nicaragua to Mexico than from China to Mexico. Um, so in those cases, in, in what the scholarship normally tells us of south to south migration flows is that people aren't there to settle permanently, that they're looking to be temporary workers, that they're looking to find uh, flows in which they can trade their, their goods that they're producing at home, but always maintaining their roots in their home country because it's so close to the places that they're inhabiting. Um, so what this research has the potential to show is, is one that for Mexico, we might be seeing greater, an, an increase in diversity and a break in the homogeneity of the cities because you're having more immigrants from China, you know? And at the same time, once you begin this flow of, of migration from the Asia, you're also starting to see a, an, an increase in the number of Korean people that are entering the social space and the number of Japanese people that are entering the social space. So we have these like small scale disruptions that for now are small scale but that are increasing because of this social networks factor. Um, we also learned that South-South migration through a process of globalization in which what we tend to think again of the quote unquote global South um, it's changing, you know, it's so rapidly changing that these pockets of development um, are spreading everywhere. Guadalajara is one case, Mexico City definitely, Santiago would be another place, um, Lima also has a very large Chinese immigrant community um, right now. And that's just letting us know how quickly the, the global south in development, development terms is catching up to the global north and how more and more we can see these this bottom-up globalization of different regions of the world where people, rather than corporations, spread ideas and spread knowledge and spread a different understanding of cultures. So that's something that I, I think future research could really look into how, how um, in different cases and in different urban spaces in the Global South, not only in Latin America, but uh, in Africa that is also like m starting to receive large Asian migrations. Um, we can see spaces being globalized from a person-to-person -person level rather than, again, corporations, industries showing up and, and, and bringing in um, Western cultures. So something that we all sort of thought about as we were working through our projects, um, both from this like macro scale of the university to looking at transnational migration, uh, or the ways in which we were in some way like maybe emotionally tired or emotionally exhausted from the process and how we took care of ourselves in doing this work and how our work lends itself to, the, to caring for or helping the communities that we work with. Uh, so also thinking back towards the scholar activism piece of what we were talking about earlier. So I know for me, something that was really troubling throughout the process of uh, making my map was that it was in really intended to be an an inner community, an intercommunity space for thinking through uh, ideas and narratives that folks of color wanted to vocalize and verbalize and and make visible, but because of the format of what I created and because of contemporary media notions of what safe spaces and sort of the controversy surrounding like the coddled college child and things like that. Uh, I received a lot of anonymous pushback and some of that was really scary and some of that was really violent. And when I was talking about earlier not putting everything that I received onto my map, it was particularly instances that I felt were veering into cyberbullying or threats that I decided not to put in the map, both as because I did not want to make them present and uh, legitimate, but also because I put them in a separate section. It was like a cyberbullying or <laughs> threat-based section so that people would know that this happened and that I was recipient to these things and how anonymity, anonymity became this generative force for uh, people sort of airing out a lot of uh, really unfortunate and scary grievances. But I didn't want to make them be a direct part of the actual project I was working on because that seemed to derail and decenter the voices I was actually trying to highlight and center. Uh, so a couple of examples of that would be, I think, uh, as someone who is a survivor, someone had written in one of their anonymous threats that uh, my assault wasn't valid and that I was not allowed to say certain things about certain people, even though I wasn't writing any of these things that I'd put in my map, right? I'd been collecting things from folks. So that was 
really scary because this person knew a, lo a lot about me, apparently, but also was like able to then use that and instrumentalize that. Uh, and then another example was uh, someone who sort of listed out his multi-privileged identities and then was like, I deserve to be here, you don't, uh, which was fascinating. Um, <laughs> but also false. I mean, anyone who got here deserves to be here. Uh, and the audacity with which he was able to make those claims honestly underscored the reason that the map was needed in the first place. Uh, because you could not access that form without having a brown.edu email. And so that meant there were people who were carrying these opinions and were using the anonymity of the form to be able to vocalize them. And they're scary opinions and they're divisive ones and they're ones that are deliberately trying to exclude and minimize the achievements and worth of people of color on this campus. And so for me, even though I was really upset by that whole host of um, cyberbullying, as it were, it f sort of underscored the necessity of the project for me even more. And that was really, really helpful. And in terms of the ways in which I was sort of able to go through that, uh, as someone whose positionality was very much intertwined with the, that of the people that I was working alongside uh, as being like a student of color, woman of color, uh, I was able to surround myself with the communities that made me feel safe and made me feel as if my work was important. And that is what let me sort of continue doing the project in a way that felt good to me. Uh, looking back on it at the same time and you know, retrospective reflection is super important. There were a lot of ways in which I could have definitely improved upon it. More time is always the most important thing. Uh, it was sort of built into the deadlines of a class assignment and because of that was expediated in ways it didn't necessarily need to be. And it's something I've sort of gone back on and read every once in a while and think through how the ideas of a participatory mapping can be built upon. Maybe even to do a qualitative student, a campus climate survey in the future that doesn't just look at demographic data but looks at individual student experiences. So there is a lot of possibility that exists within a participatory mapping model that I think my project was just a taste of, uh, both in the ways in which uh, people within the community can violently push back, but in the ways in which it like directly helped uh, the folks that were able to participate in it. So I hope that it's a stepping stone for larger conversations. And I do know that whenever I published through uh, one of our student publications here, Blue Stockings, uh, I was reached out to by the dean of first and second year programs at Harvard, uh, asking how I was able to do that, and someone at Duke as well. So they were really, really interested and invested in hearing the narratives of students of color in a more expansive way. Uh, and our own Office of Institutional, Diver Institutional Diversity was also asking similar questions. And so even though it wasn't the uh, extent of a project it could have been or I would have wanted it to be, it was certainly a really important stepping stone, allowed me to understand the importance of it through the pushback I received and also allowed me to realize the kind of support network I had in my scholarship uh, upon being able to retreat to that kind of safe network in light of uh, the difficulties I experienced throughout the process. So uh, it was its own claim to space in some ways, uh, the validity of such a map existing and the validity of such a project being important and being uh, legitimated through other institutions that also are trying to examine the, the spatial violences that may be inherent in them. And while it was certainly exhausting, it was also my first taste of this idea that if you're not, if your work isn't controversial, even a little bit, you may not be pushing enough boundaries. And so I thought that was really, really valuable. Uh, like Andre, I also faced uh, quite a bit of pushback. So um, I, was, I started NCFW when I was in India summer of 2014. And um, as I said, it started off as a very like small, humble project. We were going to go to eight schools and then return to Brown. But somewhere along the way, we like found some random ex-documentary maker who was out of like unemployed and just wanted something to do. And he was like, "Can I just like make a video about your work?" And like we didn't know what we were doing, so we said okay. And then he released it without like telling us, but it was fine. It was like a good video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he started sharing it, and so we were like, okay, I guess we'll share it as well. And initially, like, it, it started to spread very well amongst, like, 
family and friends and people were being really supportive and I was like, oh my God, this is great. Like word is getting out about our work. Maybe we can like get more funding or something like that. And then it went like properly viral, which was actually terrifying. I got super uncomfortable because, um, so it got picked up by the Indian version of BuzzFeed, which just made it a lot more clickbaity and trashy than it, it really was. And the article, like the, the title of the article was, this will change the way you think about rapes forever. And it was like, we didn't give you permission to like write this article. We didn't give you permission to do this. Um, and it, it got about a million views and it got shared like hundreds and thousands of times, which was like, at first we were like, oh wow, this is like, I don't know, kind of cool. But then at some point, we started to read the comments and there, there's just a rule of the internet, you should never read the comments. And they were just scathing and nonsensical and personally attacking both me and Trina um, based on how anti-national we were for like, bring, uh, like I said, bringing Western ideas in and trying to like brainwash students into thinking and like thinking that Indian culture was bad and misogynistic and um, we, started receiving threats from uh, the political party which is in power in India right now called the BJP. Uh, just random members of the BJP going like, oh, these girls deserve to be slapped in the face, like shame, their parents must be so ashamed. That's like a classic Indian insult. Um, like f their families must be so ashamed of them. So it was really hard because this, w I mean, as m y we almost couldn't see the positive impact that was happening because yeah, the numbers of like the people watching it and people sharing it were going up, but like the comments were almost always terrible. And that's all we could focus on, especially because some of them were like weirdly elaborate, going like, oh, th these girls must be 20 something, who is giving them this money to do this? And like, where are they from? Where do they live? Where have they been educated? Where are they getting these ideas from? Um, and we had nobody except each other. It was just the two of us, and we were 19 at the time, and we like, just didn't know what we were doing. So um, I, Srina decided to stay in India just because she hadn't lived in India for like six years, and even though the work was exhausting, she really just wanted to be there um, and work there for longer. But I just had to come back to Brown, and I, I like took three classes that semester, one of them SNC, I was like, I just like, I'm so drained from my summer um, that I just have to take it easy. And the nice thing was that while people in India were being, I mean, I'm, I'm saying people in India, there were obviously very supportive people, like my friends in India, but the, m the main source of support was people from Brown because a lot of people had carried out similar projects in their home countries. Um, and people just like understood what we were trying to do, um, like my friends at Brown. So it was very, very nice to just come back here and like take a very relaxed semester. Um, and then I, I ended up going back to India that January and working on No Country for Women again, and then again um, in the summer. And then I was like recharged and fine. And also Srina and I decided that we needed to have like four hour conversations very often about like, how we were doing and whether we were okay and whether we want to keep going. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I had her throughout this entire process. That definitely made it a lot easier. So um, for my research, it was more just, um, I, I didn't really um, experience the, the hate that my colleagues experienced, um, but I did have like interesting experiences when um, going to do the interviews in the communities. Um, I had like a, like a theme in my paper titled like notions of safety um, in terms of like my professors, my, uh, the interpreter that went with me, um, some interns um, that went with me as well. Um, um, not all at the same time, I went with like maybe two other people to each interview. Um, but they were saying that, oh, when you go there, like be careful, like um, it's not safe there. Um, and you know, I, I, it, it was more just like, I guess like, I noticed that as like, um, it was like a barrier that some of the activists may have in doing their work um, because they're just seen, their communities are seen as like, um, they're, just, they're just really disrespected in general. Um, and 
Um, so, like, again, like, I was just, like, a um, U.S. study abroad student there for, like, a month. Um, so I, it was more just hearing um, of, like, the barriers that the activists had in doing their work and um, being seen just in really um, disrespectful ways. Um, yeah, I would say my experience in self-care uh, relevant to this project was a little bit different as well because um, while I was doing my research, I wasn't necessarily in vulnerable situations, right? Because I returned to a city where I had been born. I returned to a city where people saw me as, as, as a member of the national body. And um, in fact, like people were very supportive of my research um, when I was in Guadalajara uh, because the academic, the academic community there wanted to know more about this immigration flow that had started coming into citizens since the 2000s. And at the same time, Chinese immigrants were um, relatively welcoming um, to sharing their experiences with uh, a Mexican young person who for some reason like spoke their language and who they could relate to in a way that uh, maybe wasn't as facilitated with other other members of the of the local community um, but at the same time I think a lot of the a lot of the community care that had to go into like the making of this project and the completion of this thesis was the fact how, like how what is my position in ensuring that this community like remains safe in the sense that anybody who's there and documented isn't exposed to uh, legal measures and making sure that like people in in Mexico don't misinterpret my work because there 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 are some um, historical anti Chinese sentiments throughout the country, you know, and I think the legacies of that are still pervasive in, in, in the social spaces, um, minimally, uh, because I think a lot of people are also very open-minded into welcoming the, these immigrants and learning more about them and learning more about their culture um, and kind of deconstructing that idea of, of what Chineseness means. Um, but I definitely like, and, and the project, especially when I came back to Brown, had to evolve a lot because as a student of international relations, uh, my first inclination was to find some way in which this was like relevant to states and where states became involved, you know, and there was certainly like a big push in, in, in my department as well as within myself to think that that was what was gonna make this project worthwhile. And that's not the case and that's not the way that the project turned out because throughout the entire writing process, that was when I started feeling really vulnerable and feeling like, uh, what does it mean for me to be writing with this state perspective? Again, feeding into this narrative that like states are more important than people and people's narratives are only relevant once they're brought into a state conceptualization. Um, so as much as possible, I think, especially during the spring semester, I try to push away from that narrative and try to see this more as like flows of people. And again, this idea that um, you know, that globalization happens in interpersonal relationships and it happens with having different people coming into a society that before, w like before, didn't experience anything and any of the, of the cultural factors that they were bringing in and a society that without this immigration maybe would have a different conceptualization or continue with old patterns of understanding what Chineseness or even Asian culture is like. Um, so definitely I think um, that's more where the self-care component in my, in, in my project fell. Great, thank you so much. Uh, do y'all have any questions for us or do we have any questions for one another? Um, that's a really tough question because I also don't think I was able to address it successfully, uh, which is like one of the biggest drawbacks and one of my biggest regrets. Um, we kind of like, there, there was just, n we had so much information to deliver 
and we didn't package it in like we, we just avoided saying like or if avoided implying in any way that like the West was better in any way. We just kept it strictly within an Indian context. We weren't comparing to other countries. We weren't like doing anything like that. Um, all we just kept saying is that this is a global problem and misogyny happens everywhere and it's bad everywhere. It's bad in the US, it's bad in Norway and it's bad here. Um, but let's just focus on us. Let's like not compare ourselves. Let's just focus on like the ways in which it's bad here and try and fix that. And that's it. I have a question for Angel, actually. As you were talking, I, I was wondering, like, from your project, what do you learn about um, the ways in which we create space and the ways in which we can create safer spaces and how we determine what that safety means for whom and in what ways it becomes safe for different people? Yeah. That's a great question. So I think something that I learned was both uh, was something about the importance of speaking the unspoken. And so there are a lot of buildings on this campus that have a really storied past. And there, there is a, an importance to sort of vocalizing what that past is. So there are students who, once they find out, maybe through reading the slavery and justice report, maybe through hearing from a friend, maybe from attending TWTP. That university hall was built like on indigenous land by indigenous and black slaves, and Brown was complicit in the transatlantic slave trade. That creates an immediate spatial violence that students have to reckon with every time they come onto the main green. And that doesn't mean that that building needs to suddenly become unsafe or needs to be inherently troubling to students but that history needs to be spoken, and students need to know what kind of spaces they're entering. And once that can be actualized, there can be, act there can be a remedial relationship between physical spaces and the people who inhabit, inhabit them. Similarly, spaces that are born out of activism have, especially like post-90s, lost a lot of that history. You can look at the ways in which the Third World Center has now become the Brown Center for Students of Color. That, is a mark of depoliticization. It's a changing time in which people don't know what third world is a means anymore. And we had to change a center's name to respond to something like that. So understanding the history from which that comes allows people to better enter that space uh, with the full knowledge of all of the history it carries. So that's one layer, is just understanding the physical histories of spaces you're in. And that's something as simple even as acknowledging that if you're in the United States, you are probably on stolen land. You are, are on stolen land, um, unless you are like a Native American person. Uh, so that's one example of sort of acknowledging the spaces that we're on. Uh, another thing in terms of building generative space, ge generating safety within spaces out of that is once you have a clear understanding of what you're working with, what sorts of things we're complicit in, we can better build communities that acknowledge all of our marginalizations and allow us to uplift one another, which is to say that the norm within the spaces that we create should not be uh, to, for the person who has the most power in that space, because that immediately disenfranchises everybody else in that community. And so if we're being intentional about the spaces we create, we should always be siding with the people who have the least amount of power and destabilizing the notion that things can be implicitly spatially violent. So walking into the faculty club, the norm is this expectation that everybody in the portrait room is a white man. That's spatial violence um, because it creates this norm that there can't be a person of color, a woman of color, a trans person of color like on that wall. And recognizing that, recognizing the history behind that, destabilizing that by telling ourselves this can change and will change. and being cognizant of the ways in which we also may carry power in that space and how to check our own power are all, I think, central concepts to building inclusive communities. And that's something that I saw sort of come through in people's notions of safety within the project, where they were like, I know this place's history. I feel comfortable about it. I know people here. They care about me in my humanity. And I know that we're working to make this place better. So there's like a direction for the ways in which we want to continue making this community. And that's sort of what I saw as being intentional safe space building. Any other questions? 
I have a question for Ria and, and Ana Maria as well. Um, and it's actually more of a, a compounded question, so I guess maybe we can take it in stages. And Ria, I was, I was going to ask you if you could speak a little bit more about um, how your project sees the idea of like collective action and collective activism mm -hmm. um, from the women that go through trainings like the one that you conducted in, in your project, as well as any others that uh, might be taking place in the city. And then from that, maybe like Anna Maria can speak a little bit more because you did mention collective action in the claiming of spaces in, in, in Santiago um, and how you have seen the, the outcomes of, of those actions and how they have been effective to like reclaiming space. Um, or, you know, like how, how do you problematize what people, like how people act collectively and how that is perceived by, by what they're acting for? Um, so the our mission statement or whatever um, was to change mindsets um, of people in our country t towards um, women, and that just in itself means that we like put a really strong emphasis on collective action. So um, one of the the biggest activities that we did was we would make calls for submissions on our website and on our facebook page asking um people not just women to um submit stories relating to um it would, it would be like a prompt like ha when have you faced misogyny in the workplace or when have you faced misogyny like in a public space and people would anonymously submit anecdotes and then we would like share them as one giant um collective digital campaign. And we just like wanted to get people's stories um, and narratives shared throughout India so that like people would feel more of a sense of urgency. Because it's like people don't really talk about it. So I guess the collective action that we were um, trying to induce was just people to just start talking about it. So I'm not really sure I understand your question. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as you documented collective action happening in Santiago, uh, relevant to the reclaiming of urban space, like how do you see the outcomes of those efforts? How are they mechanized? How do people come together? And how do they like achieve goals? You know, because I think um, as a student at Brown, we like understand how we organize in activism and social justice activism through collective action. But I think you would be really great at giving us like a transnational perspective of how these movements happen for, diff for similar causes in different spaces. Um, so, a lot of it was um, kind of like, mm, like that isn't that I'm more familiar with in terms of um, they organize protests, um, they um, have the weekly meetings, um, but I think also um, like the fact that Doris is like running to be um, running for like the municipal office, like I feel like that says a lot um, in terms of complicating um, like like how she is an activist. Um, so. I mean, yeah, a lot of it like does like seem to be uh, similar to like what I'm used to um, in the U.S. Um, and the things that Casa did in New York. Um, but I guess like what was different is that um, they framed their work around like the right to build community. Um, so like they were saying that like I think we should we should um, have like the space to me and like you know like the government um, should like pay for it because like we have a right to. Um, like have this community so we can like better advocate for um, like our needs. Um, so that that was really um, like really interesting takeaway. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have a, I, I went through a lot of um, like, just like self care issues um, during my writing process at Brown, and uh, it was really great for me to be able to form a very close relationship with my primary thesis advisor, um, because he is an anthropology anthropologist. He also does work with um, Chinese communities in Mexico, but more from a gendered component. 
Um, so he know he like was able to really understand the research that I was doing. He was really able to understand like the ethnographic notes that I had been able to collect and a lot of the problems that I was having conceptualizing how my project fit into states and how that like devalued the stories of the people. So he was very important in like helping me work through the process and like helping me bring the project together in a way that was more focused on the migration piece rather than the fact that it's happening across like these different states that might have a growing relationship with each other. Um, but I think for me and what it sounds for Ria and what I hope is for anybody that engages with a, with a project like this on their senior year or throughout their time at Brown is to have a really great um, support network at home and also within your friends in the Brown community, you know, because those are the people who you go to class with, you come home and you're with them, you know, and they're the ones that see your personal struggles as you try to carry on these pieces that do take a lot of, they take a lot of time from you and they take a lot from you just like mentally, you know, you have to fully commit yourself to these projects and that can be really hard sometimes. And I know for me, it's really, it was really great to have my friends there in the moments where it was just like, where it, it, like it just seemed like I was just gonna stop the project. Um, mine was more just my professor who was recently just defended her postdoctoral thesis, so she was relatively young. Um, but she was also on the program, um, she was like, um, the program was like uh, largely white, um, and there was like three Latina students, and then she was Latina, so like that was kind of useful. Um, because then like I could kind of like speak to her about how I felt like weird, like just like doing this research for like the month that I was in the country that I had never been in. Um, and I still have a lot of issues with like, just like how the program is structured in general. Um, but she was really good about, um, like in the feedback she gave me in like checking um, certain language I used um, in kind of like thinking, like prom prodding me to um, like not just take this like, oh, I learned things abroad and I'm gonna like just like leave it and like move on, uh, but really make it a part of um, like what I hope to do in my future um, postdoctoral work. Um, so yeah. I had friends, and they were really, really <laughs> helpful. <laughs> My support system was already implied in your question, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>